Hello there, welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 636. That's 636 of the Agostino Zynga Show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga. I hope you are doing well wherever this pod may find you. I hope you are doing well. How am I? All good orphans considered. I'm eagerly, eagerly, eagerly anticipating the day that I go to gym for the first time in the new year. I had to wait until the third, which is probably the day you're going to be listening to this. I'll be should by the time you listen to this, I should have been in the gym already. I should have already got my two sessions in and going to be pumping and running and stripping all this flipping, you know, unnecessary LBs that I have on me to get myself in the best shape possible throughout this entire year. It's been a bit annoying because I mentioned in my previous pod, it's been closed since I think the 26th or something. No, 22nd actually, crazy. 22nd until now for some necessary maintenance work. But, you know, with it being a local council gym, necessary maintenance work could just mean they wanted to give it a deep clean. I doubt there's going to be any real big structural or interior changes in the whole leisure center. That's what it essentially is. I call it a gym, but it's more like a leisure center where they kind of prioritize these things to kind of make sure the local populace has a you know safe and somewhat easy place to get to in terms of doing some exercise and there's obviously a decent gym in there and it's obviously very um, heavily subsidized I think I paid like 25 pound or something and that basically allows me to you know it also covers classes as well which you never get in most high level gyms they usually you know always have the classes to be a bit of a top up so the value is what it is and sometimes you just run into issues for the longest time we used to have this app that we'd use to scan ourselves in which was funny because you have an app to scan yourself in so you'd have an app to book sessions that you wanted in and that mostly started around the time covid happening i think when the restrictions of covid were being lifted and we're returning to some semblance of normality one of the things that kind of got introduced and sort of stuck was this checking in thing with gyms where you, if you had a pass you know you had to book a, a particular time period you went to go um usually they're in hour increments and then you would kind of you know book that confirm it and then you'd go and i think that was because if i remember correctly when gym did reopen they were trying to limit how many people were in the gym which was a bit dumb because if you know sometimes if you say you're going to be till seven to eight you might stay there until nine so the idea that you're going to have an exact precise number of people as in like 10 or 20 or 30 only per hour is ridiculous but they tried to do something and the funny thing that i thought about it was that the app for the most part was always buggy naturally so and then still when you went and booked it you still needed to kind of carry your physical parts of you you couldn't just do what some apps do where they have like um they have like the flipping what should we call it uh they have the qr code that you can kind of look in kind of generate each time and then you can scan that to go in you physically have to take the actual plastic little thing that i have which is kind of similar to like a tesco um you know express card or something and take that with you to scan yourself in now of course these little plastic card things you meant to put in your key rings on your keys they usually you know they're kind of made out of crappy material they break really easily they can slip off or sometimes you can just forget them so there's been plenty of times where i've been there i've forgotten them and you have to go queue up at a gym and try and you know get some assistance from someone that works there and if there's anywhere where you don't want to get customer service is at a local leisure center there's always, you know, a queue of some, you know, um, flustered or stressed out mum who's got way more important things to kind of worry about than you trying to get into a gym to do a couple of dumbbell curls. And usually the kind of customer service they have in those kind of places isn't the most like, okay, let's try and get you in and out as soon as possible. It's a lot of kind of, you know, you're right, you're right. You're right. A lot of like, um, a lot of probably genuine empathy <laughs> coming from people, which is annoying. I kind of like that cold, stark sort of, um, dealing with customer service where you just kind of go in you go out you try and get the people in and out as soon as possible um you as a customer you just blabber and get to the point as fast as possible but in those kind of places that doesn't happen so it's a little bit of a concern but hey what can you do but i'm happy to be back hopefully by the end of the day you shall hear me grunting in your head probably doing some power cleans and some back squats and some bench presses and deadlifts and going on a row machine all that stuff is going to happen tomorrow and i can't wait to get started i cannot wait to get started but anyway talking about getting started let's just roll into the pods because i've got a lot of topics to talk about so i don't want to waste too much more of your time hope you are well hydrated and limbered up today i've got a nice nice hearty mug of tea next to me it's actually called afternoon tea that's the actual blend of the tea bags let me have a little sip now and see how it tastes hmm decent afternoon tea 
doesn't taste too bad and you know a little dashing of honey in there sets it off marvelously cannot deny cannot deny so moving on first things first i want to say r.i.p to vivian westwood this happened a couple of days ago a few days ago now on the 29th obviously um as you can see there via the date via the vivian westwood official instagram and unfortunately vivian westwood passed away just before the end of the year and um yeah man tragic news to be honest real, real tragic news in one heart but on the other side of things considering you know she lived a very very fulfilled full vibrant and influential life i don't think it's something to mourn too much in that respect but for me it's interesting because my sort of um journey or my sort of knowledge of vivian westwood kind of started unconventionally even though she's a you know uh a, she's a british establishment she's a legend here in the uk it wasn't something that i kind of i didn't know her directly from what she did in the uk i kind of came in it from a long way around so when i first started getting into streetwear um, I was and still am obsessed with the guys over in Japan, right? The guys like Hiroshi Fujiwara, Nigo, John Takashi, um, Tetsu, um, the guy that does Neighborhood. I forgot his name now, but all these people I was sort of obsessed with, that whole crew of people skating and the kind of, you know, that Harajuku scene, that streetwear scene from back in the day was something that I was obsessed with to the point where I was getting sent over like old magazines from back in the day and like scanning those pictures and putting them up on my blog and whatnot and writing, you know, enthusiastically about why I love these people, why I want to kind of emulate them in my way. And if you're a fan of those guys, especially somebody like a Hiroshi Fujiwara, you will know that he's obsessed, literally obsessed with punk movement in like the let's say what the 70s to early 80s or that kind of you know region when it sort of started and also hip-hop I mean, probably Nigo's more hip-hop and obviously Hiroshi Fujiwara being very much influenced by punk aesthetic and everything around that and obviously something that kind of closely aligned to punk was definitely someone like a Vivian Westwood from the work that she did previously especially when you think of that shop sex and then it kind of progressed I think into the sedentaries or whatever that was called right so afterwards in terms of changing the name and then of course I um, iconically um, the work that she did with Malcolm McLaren her former partner who was managing um, Sex Pistols when they kind of first launched and that was how, sort of like how I got associated or how, sorry, how I got knowledgeable of Vivian Westwood as a brand overall and it's been interesting to see it grow over the years and kind of somehow by i don't think it's even like purposeful i don't feel like i just feel like the stuff just hits so well and it's got such visceral energy behind it it comes from a real punk diy anti-establishment you know angsty have an opinion stand for something point of view that somehow these kids nowadays the gen z tiktok types have been legitimately obsessed with like the pearls and the logo design belts and stuff and all these was accoutrements and i feel like a lot of it must come just from the fact that it's clouty and it's something that could obviously get you a lot of likes on insta but i'm sure some of those um things that i've kind of described about the brand have somehow been able to seep through and hit people who probably don't really know much about the history and how it started in any way shape or form and i think that goes to show just how powerful and just how amazing of a designer and of a cultural sort of like touch point um vivian Westwood was for her entire life um i've also was always a big fan of her kind of unconventional approach to relationships i think the recent or latest one now is with this guy i think his name is like andreas or something i think he might be greek and if i'm not if I'm enough i'm not mistaken also i got familiar with him based on a couple of editorials that they must have done for like that magazine also well think about it now there's a magazine i'm not sure if it's still out and it's popping but i used to buy this mag and collect it for a bit called 10 and if I'm not mistaken, it was founded by a lady who was also Greek, if I'm not mistaken. So maybe that was where the connection with Vivian Westwood's partner was with her. But it doesn't matter. But there was a really cool editorial that he put together with Vivian Westwood and that Andreas dude, who was a kind of, you know, the partner and the creative partner in the brand. And I always liked the kind of dynamic and how they looked in terms of pictures and whatnot and how they spoke about each other. I thought that was pretty cool. And then, of course, I remember also seeing loads of really cool editorials of Vivian Westwood, um, runway stuff that looked amazing. And I think it featured, I forgot his name, but there's this British model also. Is he British? I think it might be American, actually. With a, He's got like a really characteristic big nose rip dude and i think he used to date madonna back in the day he might have been in actually in her book um which i think was called sex as well and he was modeling vivian westwood and making it look amazing he had like you know shirling jackets on and big fur coats and whatnot he looked really really good and that's all the kind of memory i have and of course me and myself you know having bondage pants having pirate boots back in the day i remember that being a big thing back in camden 
when I was kind of coming up, going to Camden and seeing guys in the market reselling um, pirate boots. Obviously, the what you call it? Oh, what's the hat called again? I forgot what the hat is called. The name of it. I'm trying to think of it. The one that Pharrell wore, but I saw it prior to that um, on people like Nigo. You know, in old scans, he was kind of wearing that hat quite often. And you see people selling them also. There was a period in time where the shop, I think, World, the thing's called World's End. Yeah, it's a finisher shop now, very much of shop. And there was a period of time where they couldn't fulfill demand for those hats when Pharrell ended up making them a hit. Because they were obviously a thing for a while, but he obviously picked it up and it kind of turned into a worldwide hit to the point where I remember when I was working at the 1948 store in Shoreditch, there was this really cringy dude. I'm going to say he's like a black French guy because no black French guys are like, they're like different. You know what I mean? They're not like, you know what I mean? They relax their hair and stuff and whatnot. They seem to put like, you know, Caucasian ladies on some really weird high pedestal. They've got some weird vibe about them. But you know, I remember this black French dude that used to come into the store quite often. Cool dude nonetheless. But I just remember him like being a stan, like a legit stan, like an adult stan. I think that's why I've always kind of had a bit of a disdain for it because I just couldn't understand how an adult could have no personality or personal or sense of style themselves to the point where they're just copying or cosplaying what someone else was wearing. I remember one week he'd come in wearing like what Kanye wore. So I think there was a period in time where Kanye had like, yeah, I think there was, a, maybe it was um My Beautiful Dutch Mr. Fancy era where Kanye used to have the mohawk with the denim jacket. And I think he was wearing jewelry pieces, like Lego pieces from those two black twins that used to make jewelry. I'm not sure if you remember it. Back in the day, there was a period in time, these two guys from New York, twins that were involved in like street wear and like design and just being socialized and stuff. And they used to make these really cool little brooches out of Lego. And he, you know, Kanye was wearing that for a period. And that dude pulled up one time wearing that sort of kind of outfit, like the light denim jacket, the kind of faux mohawk thing, um, you know, whatever. And then the next time I saw him come into the store, he basically was wearing the same whatever outfit Pharrell was wearing when he had the Vivian Westwood, you know, huge hat on. I remember just looking and thinking, wow, what a wild lad. But also, you know, the influence that somebody that would never really have known of Vivian Westwood beforehand would go out and buy the brand just because of one person who they kind of looked up to. And who knows, maybe that could then lead them into buying other stuff on the brand. But I remember having a couple of wallets from them. I remember having um again the boots back in the day i had a couple of t-shirts i've got a couple of mohair jumpers that are basically inspired by that kind of era right i've got this sort of then and one which is black and red and this other one that's like white and black which you know if you've seen me about back in the day you would have known that i was wearing those jumpers into the ground and those are kind of linked to you would say to that kind of punk aesthetic there was a recent actually recent collection from luebe where he put together a look with these like black leather bondage pants which are really cool and they kind of reminded me a lot of the Vivian Westwood um, parachute bondage type pants from back in the day. Um, the ones with the tartan were really cool. I think Supreme had done a couple of those. Every brand's done their own iteration of you know bondage parachute pants, you know, whatever, right? And I don't need to go through that whole history, but still, man, like impact has been strong in the fashion, in culture, in everything. And like I said, it's really tragic, but also it's not something to get super down about because I legitimately think this lady lived one hell of a fun life. It would have been nice. I don't know if it, this is the fact. I'm, I haven't really checked it or Googled it, um, especially to go off the cuff these sort of things. But I don't know if there's an official autobiography out of hers. That would have been really cool to have got done, like an official for autobiography um, in her own words because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of sort of like um, people doing stuff in their own way, journalistically ask, you know, kind of, getting together a picture of who she was as a person um, from different people, maybe close people, maybe loosely associated, but it would have been nice to have heard her own voice, like autobiography. I thought that would have been cool um, in the time. Maybe it's happened already. I'm not familiar with it. Maybe it's on the works, but I think that would be really cool to kind of check out going forward. Um, let's quickly read the caption here from the Westwood team. It said, 29th of December, 2022, Vivian Westwood died today peacefully and surrounded by her family in Clapham, South London. That's just the best way to go out, really, isn't it? And Vivian Westwood continued to do the things she loved up until the last moment, designing, working um, on her art, writing her book. Okay, good to know here, the biography I mentioned, and changing the world for the better. She led an amazing life. Her innovation and impact over the last 60 years has been immense, and she'll continue into the future. Vivian considered herself a Taoist. She wrote, the Tao spiritual system there was never more need for the Tao today Tao gives you the feeling 
that you belong to the cosmos and gives you purpose of life. It gives you such a sense of identity and strength to know you're living the life that you can live and therefore ought to be living. Make full use of your character and full use of your life on earth. The world needs people like Vivian to make the change for the better, photographed by Jürgen Teller. So also Jürgen Teller has got a nice little, you know, mention there. I think he's, to be fair, he's aesthetic of picture taking and, you know, his sort of um, style it suits you know Vivian Westwood a lot more than maybe other brands um that's that must have been quite a great privilege to see you know be able to take the final sort of pictures you know as she was here on this earth with us and there was this cool little article that I just saw now on online courtesy of a website called Kids of Dada that features some you know images from back in the day of the early sex shop on King's Road right amazing right this was back in the day when retail was a thing creating like an immersive experience and kind of you know using the store as another avenue to kind of tell a different part of the story of your overall brand allowing customers to come into your world all those sort of cool things and make it an actual destination like i remember back in the day when retail was actually at its peak you'd actually just go out just to look inside shops and to check out what was about because the shops were interesting in themselves not that you know obviously the products helped but the stores were what kind of got you in there in the first place um, but yeah, the sex shop there, you got a picture here of Westwood with some models wearing, I guess, some of the sedentary stuff as well on there. Looks amazing. Uh, be reasonable, demand the impossible. I love that. Some really cool stuff on there. I think that might be Mark McCarran actually in the back. I'm not too sure if that is him. But yeah, some cool pictures of Vivian Westwood from back in the day doing the damn oh, That's Mark McCarran there actually, I'm like, doing the damn thing. And if I'm not mistaken, the iconic picture of um, Carty on. I think it's self-titled. He's actually wearing a sedentary's um, t-shirt. I'm pretty sure, loose long sleeve. Um, sedentary. So I, I didn't even say it properly. Sedentionaries. That's it. Sedentionaries. I'm pretty sure she. He's wearing one as well on there. So definitely an icon in Ting. Uh, big up even Westwood. Gone but never forgotten. Your impact will last on and on and on and on. And then, of course, we have to, we have to, we have to acknowledge the fact that the great, the great Pele had also passed away. I think I've, maybe I, it was a day before, maybe I think this actually happened um, by around the same time. So RIP to Pele. Um, it's been absolutely amazing to see how it's been essentially his kind of passing has been somewhat mourned over there in brazil i'm pretty sure they had what they said they had three days of national mourning declared here by the brazilian government people lining the streets and celebrating um you know paying their condolences going to his old club santos and laying down reefs and messages and what he meant for the country overall the merch is on point everybody everybody legitimately is out there kind of you know making it known of kind of who he, what he meant to people out there and i think that's absolutely incredible to see it definitely kind of captured everyone's imagination that way so definitely r.i.p to pele and gone but never forgotten again another legend somebody that probably um if not probably was definitely ahead of his time um you watch old videos of pele play and you see some of the stuff that he was doing back in the 50s and whatnot and it's better if not similar to what people are doing nowadays in terms of skill so that's really cool to check and see so definitely somebody i reckon a lot of people should be going back into the archives and checking out some of these documentaries and games and whatnot and seeing what he meant to the sport overall so r.i.p to pele r.i.p to pele and then of course i need to i need to i know i've been talking about it for a while and you know i feel a little bit ridiculous talking about this stuff because i didn't go out <laughs> I spent most of my time New Year's Day essentially being a bit of a voyeur and sort of like checking out different venues around the world and seeing what was happening and what the parties looked like and who was DJing and whatnot. And, you know, for the most part, people seemed like they were having a great time. I feel like we are kind of, kind of, finally, I feel like New Year's or maybe Halloween was maybe it for me. Yeah, maybe Halloween. Oh, no, let's, let's rewind it. Maybe summer festival season was the time that I felt like the entertainment slash nightlife industry or you know whatever you want to call it kind of came back to normal i feel like people finally started to kind of get their feet under the table get a bit situated and comfortable and feel like they can plan for some future obviously unfortunately we have lost some people who have unfortunately not been able to sort of secure the funding that they need to continue on and whatnot so that's something that's definitely a little bit unfortunate in that regard but but it is awesome. It is awesome to see that, you know, events are kind of back to full swing. Everyone's kind of over the, you know, 
the unspecified virus and we're sort of back to some semblance of some normality so it was quite nice to see people having fun and you know my and i ended up in a bit of a tragedy i was kind of nervous of going and then having to wait outside for more than four hours so i decided to just stay and wait and then as i kept waiting it went from 1 a.m to 2 a.m to 3 a.m and i think before three i was actually thinking okay cool let's just see what i can do right let me just go outside and see if i can get a quick drink because i got a little offie next to me where they sell booze and whatnot a little bodega joint uh, but they usually closes around three half to past two depends and i was like yeah let me see if that's open if that's open that's a sign i should go out because you know the club that i went to go to is not too far from me i popped out to go see the shop was open guess what it's not open so i was no you know what? i took that as a sign i kind of put on my flipping sandals again and slap walk my way all the way back home in my little tiny north face jacket all the way back home and kind of you know go into my duvet and just or go under my duvet and just kind of called it at night but the Berghain, um new year's day celebrations the carnage around that has been quite interesting to see the lineup of course we all know was incredible we all know it was fantastic i was speaking about it prior i kind of wanted to go to it last minute but i then kind of you know sacked it all off it was all good it was all great it was all gravy but some of the decision making process or some of the decision making um that some people had over there just really makes me kind of shake my head in disbelief because from what I know, again, I don't have extensive experience. I haven't been going there for 10 plus years. I've been going there for a lot of years, but not 10 plus years. So even I know the big events, the kind of, you know, the the events for Gay Pride, the events for May Day, the events for, you know, again, the New Year's Day, all these big sort of events for the most part are usually the ones where the demand is crazy. And you kind of have to plan accordingly. And for the most part, if you do want to go to these big events, you should probably just try to get in as early as possible and just ride it as long as you can. So if you, whenever you, you know, quote unquote die, you die and then you leave. But the idea of going to these events, queuing early, getting in and then leaving and trying to come back again is just insane to me. Because in most occasions, you know, in most countries, I, I would imagine, uh, maybe London or UK is the only, um, is the exception in this regard. You know, unfortunately so, but I know here in the UK, most clubs don't let you re-enter. Most clubs in the UK here, once you're in, you're in. If you go, you can't come back in again. There is no re-entry thing. It doesn't happen in most clubs here. Um, I don't know why it is. Maybe because they don't want you to bring back weapons. I don't know what the deal is. I don't even hypothesize about it, but that's just the case. So maybe it's a nice surprise when you go abroad and you go to the biggest club in the world in Berkheim, or the most well-known one, right? Or the most notorious one. And then you suddenly go there and they're like, yeah, you can come back in. It's just a five euro charge. And you're like, huh? wow that's amazing you can literally leave and go and have a drink or have a shower have a nap and then come back later yeah you can just keep the wristband on and we'll stamp it when you come back in no biggie like whoa amazing cool but personally for me i think you should write that off when it's a special event you should not do that you should go out of your way not to do that you should probably try and queue up as early as possible when it opens at 12 queue up i don't know from 10 p.m or whatnot and just get in and try and ride it until you literally die and then leave and then when you leave you basically leave leave and then you don't kind of come back because you know it's going to be a ball to try and get back in but for some reason people were doing that i don't know why they were don't ask me why but they were and i found this post that somebody shared on instagram stories that, that, that was there at the new york the new year's day sorry Berghain event and again i'm not too sure if this is legit i've kind of blanked the person's name out because again i don't want to be spreading people's business but it was on a public available social media platform where everybody can see it and stuff so don't think i'm in you know intruding on anybody's privacy here but this person shared on their instagram flipping stories after an 11 hour re-entry queue round two and birthday celebrations can commence this patron left Berghain went to Berghain for the club Sylvester, right? Um, the new, the New Year's Day celebration managed to get in luckily. So, cause again, you know, it doesn't, there's no guarantee at big events you'll get in. It's not more easier or less hard, whatever. Right? It's just the same as any other event. Maybe it's even worse. Maybe the rejections about because of so many tourists come through, who knows you get in and then they left and came back again. And to get back in, they had to queue 11 hours one one ten plus one hours outside and from what i saw and from what i've experienced <laughs> it 
it wasn't warm outside. It was bitterly, bitterly cold. Everyone was had everyone had some sort of parka or a coat on or a down jacket. People were wearing hoods. I saw people were wearing balaclavas, snoods. It was legitimately cold. So it wasn't even like one of those events where you're like, oh, it doesn't matter. I can just hang outside and you kind of, you know, you do a bit of coat by saying you're getting yourself a tan or you're stretching your legs. No, 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 no. You are freezing your natters off standing outside there. And I'm just thinking to myself, like, is there anywhere in the world, especially if you listen to there, it doesn't have to be a nightclub, it could be anything. Is there anything that you would be happy to wait for 11 hours for? Like anything. I can't think of one thing, maybe outside of an emergency passport renewal. Like imagine, again, God forbid, touch wood, but imagine you're going on like a long haul flight to like somewhere in Southeast Asia. You're going somewhere in North America, Central America, South America, parts of Africa. And for some reason, like an absolute donor, you end up losing your passport. And there's a, I don't think it exists nowadays. I think you still have to, if I'm not mistaken, send something off. But imagine if there's a service that exists that allows you to go somewhere and get a passport possibly on the same day. But you have to pay like an exorbitant amount in terms of, you know, getting it like maybe 500 pounds when usually it's 120, whatever it is. And you get told that the minimum waiting time is five hours. If my holiday was dependent on me getting that passport, or, you know, whatever it may be, and there was an opportunity for me to get a flight the next day, I'm staying as long as possible because essentially that's still my holiday anyway. What am I going to do going home? Let's just try a thing and see if it works out. That's the only thing I can legitimately think that I would wait more than five hours for. And this obviously comes from a person like myself who was at the early, earlier Club Sylvester that happened in June, July, I think, that was to make up for the one that didn't happen in, you know, January of this year because of the pandemic and whatnot. And I waited a total, a max total of four hours. And I honestly think if I wasn't talking to people in the queue and I didn't kind of have a little crew with me that was kind of, you know, a bit sharing some banter, sharing some drinks and war stories and whatnot, I didn't have to call out the other person that was trying to line cut. If I wasn't kind of having a sort of good time in a queue, I think I would have left earlier than that. I didn't actually notice it was four hours until I got in there. I was like, oh, wow, I've been outside for four hours. That's when I kind of noticed I was kind of looking at my phone. But I can't imagine, I legitimately can't imagine, given how much I love Berghain, given how often I speak about it here on this podcast and stuff, and you have to unfortunately put up with me talking about it ad nauseum, I can't even imagine myself having the patience to wait outside for 11 hours. Like, I really can't. So I kind of have to commend people that do this, but also have to question people's life choices for the first, for in, like, not even just committing to that amount of time and giving away to a nightclub. I mean, just more so in the sense of, why would you go to one of the most popular events in the calendar and then leave and try and come back? Like, why? Just go and ride it out. It's a similar to like running your first, I don't know, running your first 5K. There is a knowledge out there that says, no, no, not 5K, maybe a 10K is a good example. There is knowledge out there that says, if you run your first 5K, you should just try and run as fast as you can in the beginning and then hold on towards the end. There's a lot of kind of advice in terms of how you should kind of pace yourself and whatnot. And sometimes when you go clubbing, especially when you go to places like this that kind of open, you know, consecutive days, it's probably best just to kind of go in and just smash it out, especially if it's a popular event and see how long you last, unless you're going to see someone specific. But even then, I would still say that because it's not like Berkheim, it's just one dance floor. There's various places where you can go and kind of quote unquote chill and wind down and relax in between sets before you actually see the person you want to see. So it's not even that deep. So I can't ever imagine that part. Just imagine leaving, coming back after a nap and then having to queue for 11 hours. I can understand that it happens though, because imagine you're outside for two hours already. Your brain will automatically tell you, you're here for two, you might as well wait another one. And then when it comes to three, you're like, oh, you might as well wait four. And then suddenly, you know, it's over five. There's no point in leaving now because you already committed five hours. You know what I mean? You might as well play those kind of weird tricks on you. But yeah, um, God bless them for getting in anyway. Well done. Congratulations. But damn, son. Damn. If anything, there needs to be some sort of kind of, you know, um, improvement made to kind of make those things not happen again, which I don't know if this is true, though, because I was thinking about it. Like, I remember when I was there last, it was really busy. It was actually really busy inside when the queues were long. It's not like they kind of fake, you know, some clubs kind of fake the whole demand thing by leaving you outside. It's a classic sort of trick they do in like, you know, um, really, uh, you know, snotty, pretentious sort of 
um, posh nightclubs where they purposely make you wear it outside so it makes the club look a little bit more popping than what it is, right? It's not that kind of issue. When I, I've been in there when it's ram, when legitimately on the main burger floor, you know where you kind of pass the back sort of um, platforms where people dance as cubes. People normally stand on that sort of rail where it's kind of like it's a kind of weird, you know, quasi little chair that you can sit on and sort of watch people perform. And sometimes you can pass through that kind of gangway and sometimes there's no room, literally no room. You kind of have to just walk like a lemming in the mass of people and try and walk up and there's no room whatsoever. Um, you know, queues coming out of the toilets all the way to the bar, like crazy and stuff. So when it's full, it's actually legitimately full. It's not like a lie. And I'm sure they have like the bouncers with like, for most times I've been out, the bouncers in Berlin really take seriously their little um, clicker they have to count the amount of people in there and I'm sure they have loads of stipulations around fire hats and stuff in terms of the amount of people that are allowed in there and you know if anything you know about German people they're stickler for rules so I'm sure they abide by them so I don't necessarily think there's anything they can do about that but what they can do and improve is definitely the cues for the people cutting in line and stuff that gets so annoying very very quickly and very very old and if anything, one thing they could do is just maybe introduce some um, guardrail so people can only stand in a single file or maybe at max two so that it kind of limits and makes it very difficult for people to come in and try and queue jump because I feel like most of the queue jump happens because the queue is kind of wide open until you get to the front. And at the front, it's kind of obvious because, you know, you're literally near the front. Um, and people like to queue jump just before the front or just before the barrier entry because it's a bit muddled and there's maybe some people picking up bottles there's people passing by seeing friends saying hi so there's a lot of confusion happens people can easily slip in there or just be flagrant and step in front of you but if they had a more robust or a more clear sort of uh barrier system that kind of was hard for people to get into it would kind of limit the queue cutting because there's no point in you queue cutting you know towards the back of the spatty or the spatty that's you know near you spatty was near you right or where the kind of little bit is where people leave their little e-scooters no one's going to do that but everyone wants to queue jump near the front because that's where you kind of get in really quickly so you know it is what it is but big up everybody else had patience to go there and wait that long i could never do it really much as i love that place um if, if i went on a busy night i'll just go early and ride it out like i said but max i would wait is four hours like i did previously anything more than that it's just it's just it's just unnecessary given the city you're in it's unnecessary if it's any other place in the world maybe i could consider it maybe but given the city you're in it's just unnecessary to wait outside of a club for 11 hours like you have to respect your time a little bit more but who knows who knows maybe i'm wrong in that regard Talking about Berlin and stuff, there's this really, really cool development I saw, courtesy of The Guardian, which is really interesting news. It says here, pan-European sleeper train to sweep Britons to Berlin from May 2023. Credit, right? Like, we haven't had something like this in a long, long, long time. So it says here, um, it hasn't been easy time for rail enthusiasts, but the resurgence of the sleeper train on the continent is offering Brit British travellers a tantalising prospect for 2023. A new pan-European service starting in May is opening up the possibility of jumping on a Eurostar at St Pancreas on a Friday afternoon and waking up in Berlin the following morning, breakfast included. People that eat breakfast on these type of things are legit psychopaths, I think, isn't it? It's like bringing a burger on an airplane. It's like, come on, man. Just drink some water and go to sleep. Anyway, continued. A new pan-European service starting in May is opening up the possibility. So again, I've made it again. Um, passengers of the European sleeper service would only need to make one change in Brussels. Fortuitously, the scheduling offers just enough time for a swift Belgian beer with cheese and mustard before the Berlin beckons. We thought that it would be a good time to start the weekend, said Chris Inglesman, the co-founder of the European sleeper service. So as you can see here from the map, if you're not watching this, the map basically it shows you the rough route that they're going to take so from london it would stop at calais lille then in belgium it would go to brussels antwerp and then in the netherlands it'll be rotterdam amsterdam and then as it crosses over into germany hanover and then berlin which is pretty pretty cool i'm not gonna lie and then towards um or from 2024 onwards it's going to go to dresden in germany and then into prague as its final destination the czech republic which is pretty amazing i know from myself included or myself this would be definitely an option to go to berlin more so than planes even though it's going to be a slower journey i'd imagine it'd probably take anywhere between this is an estimate in my head i'm thinking two to four hours to probably get there and i think if i'm not mistaken a ryanair jet leaving from stansted 
or Luton or South End, whatever, gets to Berlin in about an hour and a half. So it'll probably be double the time, maybe a little slightly more. But what you do get the advantage of if you do go on a sleeper train or you go on a train in general to, you know, travel continental Europe is that you get the ability to bring way more in your luggage or just to bring as much as you want, basically, that you can fit into the cart, which makes it so, so much better than going on a flight because that's one thing that kills um, any sort of bargain you're going to get on a Ryanair flight, right? Because I paid recently for a flight to go to Berlin and, the, the flight itself was like 40 pounds but then to add a check-in luggage it's 40 per flight to add the um, cabin luggage is 20 something per flight it kind of just slowly but surely increases the amount of it and then you add on top of it the um Heathrow Express or whatever or Stansted Express that you're going to get to the airport um it doesn't make things too easy because London as weirdly connected as it is there are no real easy connections to the airport you still have to pay an extra kind of toll to get to the airport um, maybe some most places are like that but it would be nice if we had a train that actually went to the airport we don't actually have one especially to places like Stansted you still have to get a specific Stansted Express from Liverpool Street that kind of takes you there and then that's obviously another 20 pound maybe 40 on the way back so it kind of easily adds another 50 to 100 quid onto your t plane ticket but with this you essentially play a fat rate to go to London to Berlin there's no bonuses needed on top. I think it's like 150. I think they said in an article or something on those kind of lines, which I think is a real bargain. Like I said, it also kind of allows your ability to kind of go crazy with the outfits. And legitimately, I would go and have like one outfit per day I can pack into my luggage and go and really kind of floss out and stuff. That's what I'm kind of looking forward to. It continues. So the announcement of the services has been hailed as a triumph by the rail aficionados who may have been suffering something of an existential crisis during the recent strikes and service troubles in Britain. It also follows a very new dawn for the sleeper train in Europe across the continent new routes have been opening up in recent years including Brussels to Prague and Graz in Austria and Hamburg to Stockholm a train that is partly a response to the increase in air fuel costs and ever growing understanding the environment to damage of flying not really I know a lot of my continental European friends they've been used to this life for a long time like friends I have that have grown up in or are from places like Spain France Italy and stuff they have spent a lot of their summers you know, traveling with their family to different parts of Europe, mostly on trains. And part of the fun of that journey was to get on a cool, fun train where you got to see cool sights, where it was kind of, you know, you got to sleep in there, maybe you got to eat something, um, meet some other kids in the train. It just kind of became like a little thing. It was kind of a, a far more... Um, more is far more enjoyable version of going on like a coach somewhere but that's something a lot of people did and obviously in the uk we never really had that privilege because for whatever reason the trains here just don't you know work that well or maybe the demand for it wasn't as high but maybe now with brexit maybe that's kind of increased it because we want to have some level of connection with the eu still i'm not really too sure but either the reason i'm still infused and really excited to kind of get on those it continues here says the first 10 carriage sleeper from berlin to brussels will depart on the 25th of may with Brussels to Berlin service scheduled for the following evening, 1922. There will be free services a week with prices for 49 for a seat, 79 for a cochette, a seat that converts to a bed, and 109 for a berth in a more comfortable sleeper uh, compartment. Sorry. Mark Smith, who writes for the popular blog The Man Seat in 61, the high speed trains are a way to travel, but for longer distances such as Brussels and Thermal Berlin to six or seven. Oh, it's not. Jesus, I said four. He's saying it's going to be six to seven hour journey. It takes half a day. A sleep allows you to leave after four days work of sightseeing and sleep your way on your own bed. So I guess if you wanted to do it, so I guess if I went to get there for the Friday evenings, I'd probably have to leave there Thursday. I'd probably leave here Thursday and then I'd get there Friday evening or maybe Friday morning, dependent. So that's pretty decent still. I'd definitely pay that. Um, and again, the prices are pretty nice as well. Um, they actually are far better prices than Eurostar to Paris. I think it's really difficult to find Eurostar to Paris return for less than a hundred euros. I don't think they exist as kind of flights. So that's pretty interesting to see. And yeah, I'm really eager to see how that kind of develops. And if anything, this will definitely, I feel like be a reason for people to get back on top of the whole like um techno tourism thing that i was doing for a long time prior to the pandemic where i was able to go to all these cool clubs in europe that i sort of obsessed over because of you know being recommended to them via articles on ra event reviews electronic beats when it was really good mix mag back in the day dj mag um white earbuds all these places where people djs or people involved in dance music culture would kind of have interviews and talk about their upbringing and where they got their first residencies from and whatnot i checked those out and it does i think i found out but places like club i club the amateurs which if i'm not mistaken is in um 
is it Munich or is it Dortmund? I don't know. Somewhere in Germany. Don't 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 hold me on it. But Club de Amateurs, which is where Lena Wilkins and the other dude who I think has got like a Slavic name, he's from and they sort of played their residence. I kind of learned about that entire scene through reading all those publications. And that's kind of got my, you know, kind of got me itching to go and travel across Europe and find all these cool places to go and party. So I can only imagine what this train's going to do for other people who maybe weren't as eager as I was prior to go on a plane and go somewhere, but maybe jumping on a train with a couple of mates or just going on your own for a couple of days would probably be a little bit easier to go and enjoy. But yeah, I'm definitely involved, definitely hyped for it. And that definitely gives me something to look forward to in the summer in terms of trips I can do. And maybe it means I can go to these places I like to go to, such as Berlin, a lot more often um, because I've got the ability to kind of take all my stuff with me. Like little things are important, like the ability to take, you know, um, moisturizer and my own shower gel my own loofah all these things i have to go to a flipping rossman to go and buy and go to an audi or little which is annoying kind of you know when you go to holiday i just want to kind of get in i want to shower i want to change i want to go around and see the size i want to go there and start buying groceries and toiletries and whatnot it just gets annoying so it's nice to have the ability to buy all this to bring my toiletries i use at home with me without having to kind of pay extra for the luggage and obviously i've got the ability to also bring different outfits for every single day imagine the big stepper out there big big stepper anyway moving on from that one what to talk about here buh, 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 buh. we have to of course mention the biggest news of the of that happened actually most of you are probably aware of this the whole andrew tate arresting which has been pretty interesting to watch and observe from afar um <laughs> I find it interesting because I don't know, like other people out there, I'm sure other people out there are the same. I didn't really know much about Andrew Tate prior to all the outsized and over the top attention that he's been getting on social media, mostly from people that don't like what he says, what he stands for, um, whatever it may be, and who are maybe trying to go out of the way to cancel him. I feel like they've done a really bad job in that because they've essentially made him a lot more popular than probably what he ever would have been. Obviously, he would, you know, he's probably always going to make a good amount of money when you're selling the grift of being able to, you know, empower dudes to, you know, drive fancy cards and hook up with models and stuff. There's always going to be a, you know, consistent and steady line of guys willing to kind of part with their 50 euros per month to kind of get into his top hustles university but i feel like in terms of his profile to the the normie person out there it's definitely been increased by this kind of crazy amount of coverage he's been getting in the press and i feel like even the recent arrest even if the, you know the charges are really serious in terms of human trafficking they're only going to go and you know one way in terms of sort of like adding to the law and everything else going over on top of it um the circumstances around the arrest were super funny of course him going through that back and forth with greta on the flipping time low so on the timeline um you know the distant narrative that's about there now at the moment that he got arrested because of his reply to greta funberg where he inadvertently had a pizza box on his table and that pizza box is a well-known pizza spot in romania and then the romanian police were able to surmise that he was in the country at the time that's when they went to go arrest him because i think he's been touring and doing the podcast interview rounds and just kind of living the bachelor life so they didn't really know where he was before they can go and arrest him um, which wasn't necessarily true you know if, if you're monitoring somebody to that level of detail you're probably going to know where they are at all times and even if he's pl- flying on a private jet they have flight manifestos and whatnot that needs to be logged you know you will we'll see what elon musk has been crying and kind of complaining about online there's no such thing as being able to fly in and out dark you know sort of things um unless you use an assumed alias but they definitely knew he was at all times i don't think the greta farmberg um jerry's pizza box was the reason that he got brought down if anything this is definitely a combination of things in terms of him probably not just being likable i'm uh, no, sorry a combination of things him probably not being likable the fact that he's definitely i feel like embarrassed um romania as a country and their officials there um the judiciary system the police force everything around it when he kind of openly talks about how easy it is to sort of finagle the system and bribe people i don't think that kind of sits too well in a country of people who don't necessarily want to acknowledge or accept the levels of rampant corruption that is obviously you know that exists in that country because it clearly does but it's definitely not a good way to sort of ingratiate yourself with people that already live there um who are looking you a bit sideways coming in there like a foreigner and sort of you know lapping up all the resources based on your riches that you kind of attained there so clearly that didn't work and then of course the fact that he kind of 
riled up and maybe spoke out, you know, regarding certain things involving key power players in different parts of the world and different industries, blah, 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 who clearly don't like being embarrassed either. And I think the convolution of those sort of things kind of led to his downfall overall. I don't necessarily think it's just because of his misogynistic views or maybe how, you know, toxic he may be. I think those things obviously aren't great, but I feel like most of it has to do with those sort of things in free that I kind of mentioned that kind of added to it. The other thing that's really interesting about him, I feel like as an observation, as having, having listened to some of his content, listened to some of his interviews and what he has to offer, it's really basic stuff which kind of makes you immediately sad. It sort of kind of reminds me of when Jordan Peterson would always start sobbing, which is sort of a sincere point of view, but it does kind of, you know, render it ridiculous when he's sort of like crying and sobbing into his flipping handkerchief about it. But Jordan Peterson's point where he's always cry would be where he would say um, that it would make it really emotional whenever he'd speak to like a father and a son or a son, and they would say something really basic like, oh, you really taught me how to be a man or I never really had a father figure or this is really important, like really basic anecdote that Jordan Peterson said really kind of moved and in, impacted them in their lives. And I remember Jordan Peterson reflecting saying, oh, that's really sad that I, if it wasn't for me, that this person would have never been able to have kind of, you know, hold their head high or seen that they have value or whatnot, whatever it may be. And that's the sort of same thing that I had when I listened or saw the, you know, the Andrew Tate stuff, minus the tears. I was thinking to myself, rah, man, there must be some really desolate, lost men out there who clearly aren't getting the help anywhere else, who go to Andrew Tate for some level of um, solitude, some level of direction, inspiration, motivation, that they don't get anywhere else in their life. That's a concerning part of it, because call him what you want to call him but why is why are those guys that are going there not going to anyone else that's maybe a little bit more pc a little bit more pg or maybe says the right things why aren't they going there why is he able to kind of capture these young men's imagination and clearly there's something that those guys are missing out on maybe it's an education system maybe it's at home maybe societally i'm not really too sure but that's definitely something that came to mind in that regard um the other side of things i was making of it is like the misogyny thing is interesting isn't it because it's like on one hand, I'm sort of looking at it thinking, what's the problem really? Because if I have to look at it with a real objective point of view, and again, not being a fan, I'm not really too familiar with the guy outside of a bit of research I've done on him this week based on all the, you know, um, uh, sort of uh, attention that's been brought to him based on his arrest. For me, I look at it and I think to myself, like, Andrew Tate is no different than these kind of radical, radical, radical feminists that I sometimes follow on social media who are, immensely anti-male right to a point where they're like you know they kind of bemoan the fact that men exist in the first place and there's a real kind of movement around the whole like you know get paid do what needs to be done dash the men to the side you can do what you want to do no one can judge you this kind of mentality which i don't really have a problem with i think everyone should be allowed to do what they want to do with their body um it is what it is um it's none of my business whatsoever how you put food on the table or how you how you feed your own family or how you just live your life do what you want but i honestly think andrew tate is on the different side of the gender coin on that sort of debates like he's no different than those ladies that say they hate men online maybe he doesn't hate women i'm not too sure maybe he does but i don't think that they're that different in that respect that this is what you get when if you get like hyper femininity this is like hyper masculinity to its zenith this is what you end up with, like a dude who kind of, you know, is maybe preaching the message of like, you know, get get ripped, get money, get fast cars so that you can have the pick of the litter basically and dash them and do what you need to be done because you're a quote unquote high value man. Or as DJ Academics was screaming, you are the prize, you are the prize. Those sort of messages. I don't feel like they're any different than, you know, hate men, hate this, hate that. Um, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. I'm looking at it a weird way, but I don't think they're that different in that regard. Um, the trafficking case, the trafficking charges against him are weird, especially how, from what I've read online and how they kind of do um, criminal investigations or this sort of level in Romania. For whatever reason, um, this is the update, recent update from the case where it says Andrew Tate, Romanian police hold influencer for 30 more days. They initially charged him with human trafficking. And I think, let me see what the other charges were. Because they're pretty heavy. They're not like stuff, you, you know, it's not like he's getting charged for saying a racy, it's not like he's being arrested for saying a racy joke on YouTube. Um, Tate was arrested on first alongside his brother Tristan, 
as part of an investigation to allegation of human trafficking and the R word, right? So pretty heavy allegations against them. You would assume when they arrest someone on those charges, they already have all the evidence that they need to sort of bring those charges to you. They don't need any more time to kind of gather evidence or put a case together. But for whatever reason, that's what's happened here. From the sounds of it, they've given, they've been held for 30 more days while the police does extra work behind the scenes, if I'm not mistaken. Let me see if I can uh, find this here. Um, actually, let me read it. Maybe it says here, fame. Does it say 30 more days? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, cool. Outside the court case, um, said the appeal of detention. Is it to confirm it? Due intention? Yeah, so there we go. During the detention hearing, the two brothers rem to re maintain their right to silence. Their lawyer told the BBC. Earlier, the police spokesperson told the BBC that the 36 year old would be held at a detention centre. On Thursday night, the Romanian. Uh, Direct, how do you say that? Director, oh my girls. On Thursday night, Romania's directorate. On Thursday night, Romania's directorate for investigating organized crime and terrorism issued a statement, but did not name the tape brothers, stating that the two British citizens and the two Romanian citizens, I like how you just, you know, stripped them of all their flipping clout, two British citizens and two Romanian citizens were suspected of being part of a human trafficking group. The statement said officers identified six people who were largely responsible or, sorry, who were accused of um, sexually exploited. So the statement said the officers had identified six people who were allegedly sexually exploited by what he called an organized crime group. Okay, so they got six witnesses or six people that have accused um, them of the crime that they've been accused of or been charged with, sorry. Police alleged the victims were recruited by the British citizens who they said had misrepresented their intention to enter into a relationship with the victims, which it called the lover boy method. They were later forced to perform pornographic content under threat of violence. Yikes. Born in the US. Yeah, so crazy charges right the pictures around it obviously pretty gnarly if you want to create merch and do some sort of stuff around that or just use memes the pictures are pretty gnarly and if anything because he's already got a little bit of a quasi toxic kind of image around him they only sort of add to the law i think these guys think they're embarrassing him but with his sycophants and fans out there they're gonna see this and lap it up and be like yeah takes you know free tape he did nothing wrong bloody blah, blah 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 but like i said previously i find the investigation uh, process really interesting because if i'm not mistaken i've read a bit maybe it's not here in the bbc but i did read somewhere that they were holding him for 30 more days to gather more evidence which is weird to me you would imagine if you investigate somebody on those sort of heavy charges you have all the evidence you need to charge them you don't need more days to sort of put that together maybe i'm not maybe i'm wrong who knows maybe this is what happens all the time when it comes to organized crime you want to get the criminals off the street first make sure they don't run uh make sure they're not kind of you know eliminated by other gangs or whatnot or anything else happens you just want to kind of bring them in as soon as possible and cut all communication with them with the outside world and then hopefully put the case together that you can kind of take to the court or whatnot going forward i'm not really too sure but either way um, the pictures obviously have been spread all over the internet. They've been made into memes. Obviously, you can see the pizza box things there going on. And again, I'm not really too sure what to think of it. I'm really not too sure what to think of it. Um, there's obviously updates here around his cars that have been um, repoed. This is courtesy of a Twitter account called Mario Nalfao, who's now decided to grift off the back of the whole Andrew Tate thing earlier on in the pandemic. I felt, oh, maybe a few years ago, he was heavy, heavy in the old SBF FTX thing and was kind of, you know, riding that to the cows come home. But now that's kind of done. There's no more reporting need to be done there because he's already been arrested, let out on bail. But basically, the court case is pending. He's now decided to jump on the Andrew Tate grift, which is funny. These social media guys always do this and they always jump on one grift to the other but he added this timely update it says as follows andrew tate supercars will be seized by romanian police this week this is not unexpected the court will determine whether those cars were acquired through money generated by the proper sorry by the purported crimes if found innocent the 11 cars will be returned to him i'm not sure if this is a picture of his actual garage it looks pretty cool if it is a nice collection of cars there but that's definitely going to be something that's going to hurt him so for sure that i'm assuming they're going to try their best to clear their names but again if they're going to this extent you're thinking, you know, there's probably where the smoke, there's fire, but who knows? Takes these cars are there listed. Bugatti Chiron, BMW M5, Ferrari 458 Italia, Ferrari 812 Superfast. There's a lot of kind of newer cars here. There's not a lot of kind of, if you're a car head cars in it, which is disappointing. A lot of these guys do this. They sort of buy the regular schmegular cars here. Nothing really that crazy. I'm impressive, but continue. Um, it says here, Andrew's Romanian mansion will also be seized this week. The former warehouse turned bachelor pad 
hosts massive parties, the podcast studios, Hustle University room and Tate's gym. This is also expected to consider the severity of the charges. So they're also going to seize the mansion, which looks pretty big. No, no cap. Looks really, really big. That's a massive facility, man. You definitely, um, maybe move to the right place in Europe to get that done in terms of space and maybe the amount of money it kind of costs to put something like this together and the gym looks fairly or whatever spa thing looks here looks fairly decent also that you can use so clearly the charges are serious and kind of egregious and I don't know it's interesting to see the fans who are like him to try and defend it I guess you can't maybe the most you can do is say hey innocent or proven guilty if you're a real big fan of his but to stand there and categorically say he didn't do nothing it's a bit wild especially when you consider this is the second arrest on those charges the first one maybe you can chalk up to swat in you can chalk up to you know they're out to get me it's a mistaken identity they want to damage my name cool but a second time you would imagine there's some evidence there that they are working with or that they've got that they know that they can you know charge him with and kind of you know um take away whatever he's created for himself over there in that regard but again i just find it interesting i just find it really interesting that similar to the whole young fuck type of case i would imagine maybe maybe again i don't know the timeline of the andrew tate thing but i'd imagine part of the reason why you'd go to a place like romania is because it's quote unquote lawless and maybe you can kind of get away with a lot more than you would in other parts of the world and also you go there to kind of take a business at the next level because then you can maybe have low overheads so that your profit margins are way higher that's how i'd imagine it to be if that's the case then surely once you get to that country you sort of would stop all the criminality and illegal stuff and just focus 100 percent on your legit business because now you have wiggle room in this country you can take more chances um, maybe that you couldn't take when you were here um, but for some reason it sounds like whatever he was up to maybe prior on the lower level he then continued doing as he started to you know get more successful attain more wealth attain more notoriety and whatever it may be which also brings attention which again i never got because if it was me and i was you know it's, it's like if you're doing acs or credit card scams early on to kind of get your streaming career started surely after once you get your streaming career started and you've got your subs and you've got your little career going you don't keep doing the scams to buy more equipment you instead try to work your ass off to do as many streams as possible and then use that funds to then go and buy the equipment that you need to go and kind of further your stream i'd imagine that's what you do but again you know maybe i'm kind of talking out of my you know boop boop when it comes to that sort of stuff but regardless crazy crazy situation all, all around i'm eager to see how this sort of develops and what evidence they actually have against him when it comes to human trafficking because that sort of smudge in your name is pretty heavy it's not something light to look over, to be honest. Um, I think if anything as well, those charges, you'd imagine even if you're found innocent, unfortunately in the court of public opinion, they're definitely going to damage your brand, you know, irrevocably so um, or irreversibly so, like to the point where you'd imagine most mainstream brands who are maybe thinking of trying to collaborate with him in a sort of weird, quasi, you know, kind of edgy counterculture sort of way are definitely going to make sure they stay way, way clear of him because that smart is just too much. Again, even if he is found innocent, the smart is found too much. And if there are legit victims out there, it's maybe encouraging that you know even though the country like romania is lawless there is some rule of law there where you can't get away with everything even though he was bragging that you could bribe just about anybody you really can't there are you know when you especially when you try to embarrass the country um especially maybe when it's done to maybe the six uh, you know accusers are maybe romanian that's also gonna be something that they'll probably take a lot of you know umbrance to but regardless, I'm really curious to see how this develops going forward. What happens? Does he get charged? Doesn't he get charged? I'm eager. I'm eager. I want to hear more. I really, really want to hear more. Then moving on, just to kind of end the show, I want to quickly touch upon the news that's kind of broke my heart regarding my one of my favorites, not my favorite favorite, because I think my favorite favorite still, if I really had to kind of gun to head sort of question, my favorite United player ever, would probably still be David Beckham, even above someone like an Eric Cantor, just because I grew up watching him play in real time. I saw Eric Cantor's career towards the tail end of it, but Beckham actually saw progress. I mean, I saw him come up in the ranks and stuff like Lingard style. Um, so that was crazy to see him go on and do what he did with his career, you know, especially when you consider all the outside 
um, distractions, quote unquote, that he had, rock star lifestyle, pop star wife, like just the you know, professionalism, the style, um, you know, the dog that he had in him as well. People don't really talk about it too often. The fact that he was a big clutch England player, he would make mistakes, but then the next tournament he'd come back and, you know, rewrite those wrongs. You know, definitely something Harry Kane should probably take a lot of, you know, notes from. But definitely a close second to people uh, or close third to someone like an Eric Cantona or someone like a David Beckham, sorry, and an Eric Cantona would definitely be Cristiano Ronaldo. And it's now been official that Cristiano Ronaldo has signed with Saudi Arabia club Al Nasser. Is it Al Nasser? Yeah, I think Al Nasser FC. Um, it's been officially confirmed now. You see me here holding the T-shirt with number seven with, I guess, one of the owners here of Al Nasser as well, grinning from ear to ear. And it's sad because if you remember the interview that kind of caused the irre irreversible rift um, between Ronaldo and Man United was the interview he did with Piers Morgan. And in that interview, he kind of, you know, specifically said that he legitimately thinks, you know, he can still play at the top level in Europe. And that was what he was looking for if he did ever leave United. And obviously he knew he was going to leave. He knew that interview was never going to be you know, received well, especially off the back of the recent spats and butting of heads that Ronaldo and Ten Hag had. And even though we were all saying he was delusional, myself included, he's definitely way past his best. And for whatever reason, maybe it's just a, a curse of being a world class, um, you know, history book, no, you know, record book, you know, breaking player in general. But for whatever reason, he doesn't seem to have the same perception of his career that we have or his current standing. He seems to legitimately think he's still as good as he previously was in yesteryears, even though we can clearly see the deterioration in him as a player isn't physically because he's obviously in great shape. It's more so you can tell that whatever his mind is trying to do, his body just can't follow in the same way that it did in the past. But for some reason, you know, um, Trishan Rado is maybe a little bit delusional in that way. Maybe it's what you need to be successful at that sort of stage or that sort of you know in that sort of sport and he legitimately thought he was gonna play for a top european club and that's what he needed and i would imagine if you're ronaldo and you kind of essentially got sacked by united and a club that he probably thought he was bet he was good enough to start and there isn't maybe a striker at our club now at the moment who could argue maybe outside of rashford that they should start ahead of ronaldo even on current form right our strikers are pretty terrible and team marshall concluded you would imagine someone like him, if that's the case, and he didn't rate United, he thought he was a good player, he didn't believe or accept Ten Hag's assessment of him, he didn't respond well to criticism from pundits and whatnot, you would imagine that one of the things that you'd want to do would be having a great World Cup and then leave that World Cup and then go and sign for a big European club that's still in the Champions League or something that United aren't in and then crush that, score loads of goals, important goals, maybe take them close to winning the cup and then prove everybody wrong again. Do you know what I mean? That's what you'd want to do. But that didn't happen for him. He had a very terrible Portuguese, you know, he had a very terrible campaign with Portugal in the World Cup. Um, I feel like he definitely showed his age there. He fell out, I think, with the manager. Maybe he didn't, maybe he didn't. He got dropped, of course, from the starting lineup. He came on and did some bits, but you obviously can do, I think, to this day, he can still be a fairly decent option for a team who's willing and happy to have somebody of his ilk who commands a, the salary that he does just sit on the bench and coming off for 10, 15 minutes. Obviously, he wouldn't accept him be banned from the dressing room, but he can be good enough off the bench. But to start these games, come on. Come on, man. Ronaldo's not that guy anymore. He just isn't that guy. So it's, it's quite sad to see that he's finally kind of essentially unofficially ended his career by going to Saudi Arabia because this is definitely a swan song. The standard of the league out there isn't the greatest. And he's obviously there to kind of collect the bag and kind of, you know, see out his final two years of his football career over there and kind of, you know, put an end to that whole thing. But it is a, a little bit of a sad way to go out, I would say, in that regard. But let's do the article regardless. So Christian Ronaldo, the 37-year-old, joins a t on a two-and-a-half-year deal after leaving United last month. He followed an express television interview in which the four said he felt betrayed by the club and did not respect the Dutch manager. And Ronaldo just bought it to be on a $177 million a year deal at Al Nassar, the biggest in football history. <laughs> How the hell do you have that much money to pay a footballer to play football in a league that I don't think is even televised, I don't think. It's just, I don't think the, Euro the Saudi Arabian League is even televised on a major sporting network, I don't think. I don't, I'm pretty sure it's not available on Fox. Probably not going to be available on, Di on, on the Zine or something. Definitely not going to be available on BBC Sports or Sky Sports for sure. 
I would imagine maybe because Ronaldo's going there. That's the thing about Ronaldo. He's commercial value, right? Because he's going there, most likely there are going to be loads of these you know, sports broadcasters who are going to want to bid and have the rights to show some of the games that he's playing or show all the games that he's playing for the remainder of this season. But to be on 177 M's per year is crazy. And it also explains why he maybe would have chosen. Like, for instance, imagine if he gets an offer from top European club, but they say you're going to play on a bench, which he finds embarrassing and, and completely unacceptable. And he's also going to maybe earn way less than that. Maybe, no, not no anywhere near it in any way, shape or form. Maybe 17 million a year. Who knows? It made sense why he'd pick that for the sake of his family going forward, especially consider what happened, you know, with the death, unfortunately, of one of his babies. Unfortunately, you can imagine that in his head, he's like, you know what? For the sake of my family and the fact that I wasn't necessarily loved that much in the UK, all the criticism for the ex pundits, my teammates, my players, my teammates, sorry, the other players and other teams, the manager, the fan base leaving me behind. Maybe it's a good place to go because he's definitely going to be celebrated. He's definitely going to play every game. If whoever, whoever is managing that team, Al Nassar, make sure you don't bench him. If they do bench him, I'm assuming they're going to get sacked because there's a story going around already that there was a number seven already at this club who didn't want to rescind or give up their number for Ronaldo and the club immediately terminated his contract. I'm not sure if that's actually true, but I'd imagine if the manager did decide to bench Ronaldo, he'd get sacked instantly. So that's not going to happen. So he's not going to get benched. He's going to play every single game in a league that's you know, a bit more slower pace. Maybe the quality is not as good. He'll score some bangers that we'll probably see on social media and then he'll be, you know, living his best life and obviously being celebrated by people in the Middle East because what you saw definitely, even though he had a very bad and abject, mediocre, I think, World Cup, what you definitely saw was star power-wise, like, Ronaldo is definitely the guy. Like, the attention that he was getting from fans and from media, um, on, you know, even sitting on a the bench, there was a massive amount of flipping photographers capturing his picture and stuff as he's singing the national anthem. Absolutely crazy. Like, it's like, you know, it's like Michael Jackson level stuff. And they just appreciate him more out there in the Middle East. So I'm not sure why. Don't get me. I don't, I don't, I don't know what his connection is with that country. Maybe there's some familiar ones. I'm not really too sure. But, he's definitely going to feel the love. If he didn't feel the love at United, it's going to be the complete opposite in Saudi Arabia. You would assume and you'd hope so. But anyway, the statement from the Alnus's Instagram says as follows, this is more than history in the making. This is a signing that will not only inspire our club to achieve even more greater success, but inspire our league and our nation and future generation of boys and girls to be the best version of themselves. When I was said to undergo a medical at Mosul Park, the modern home of Al-Nassar, before completing its formalities and being revealed to fans in the club's yellow and blue colours in Saudi Arabian capital of Riyadh, in the coming days it says here from Ronaldo I'm eager to experience a new football league in a different country and his vision is very inspiring the club quoted Ronaldo is saying while the signing is likely to prove a massive boost for the Middle East and football is also a fuel debate about Saudi Arabia using so-called sports washing to boot the IRS shout out with your moral high horse nonsense sportingly wise it's a sad way to end it um, you know, the the Piers Morgan interview definitely backfired. If he thought that interview was going to land him a top position to play a top club, or so it's going to land him a top club, it definitely did the opposite. If anything, it showed how destructive he could be in a, as in a dressing room when he's not playing. I feel like a lot of the bigger clubs out there, especially ones with clear sporting directions, probably saw that interview and like, you know what, we're going to stay as far away as possible from this guy because he's pretty toxic and bad for the brand if he's going to throw his tummy, his, no, throw his uh, dummy out um, when he doesn't play when clearly he's not at the level that he once was prior. So I think it probably did the opposite in terms of what he wanted it to do. But if you look at it and you're charitable, you could say that was a plan all along. He went to leave the club. He never went to be there. And him kicking up a fuss and saying what he said on national TV kind of essentially led to him leaving, which is definitely what he wanted. And now he's left and he's getting the bag, like securing the bag in a big, big way. It makes complete sense why he'd do it. And, you know, 177 M's per year is just insane amounts of money. Um, but definitely it's a swan song. It'd be surprising to me, really surprising, shocking even, if he turned around and came back and started playing in Europe after this. I can't see. I think this is it. This is the final swan song. He's done what he's done and let's continue. Let's keep it moving. I think that's what's going to happen. But hey, I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Anyway, that has been the Agassino Zinger Show episode number 636. Thanks again for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have your company as per usual. If it's your first time checking out the pod, all you have to do 
to show me your thanks is just share it that's what you have to do just share it nothing else needs to be done just share it if you already um haven't already that'd be great appreciate it. if you want to leave me a five-star review or a four-star review sorry on places like um, spotify apple wherever you listen to your podcast or they have a rating system for the show do that also that will really help um in terms of the things that i want to do going forward in terms of getting sponsorships and whatnot so people can see that people are watching this stuff and liking what i do that'd be great and if you just want to just listen and have a good time then i'm happy that you tuned in also if you're listening to this via the audio version, you'll definitely hear my tune of the day in the background right now. If you're watching this video, video portion of the show, you will not, and it will just fade to absolute black. And I'll see you guys again very, very soon. So take care, be safe. Peace.